Hello, and welcome to the first episode of a series that we are calling Between Two Makers. This is a series that the guys have been thinking about for quite a while, and we have finally been able to put it uh, together. Uh, this is a series that we're really trying to highlight not only cool pieces of tech, but also makers in the community. Uh, we're hopefully going to be doing a video series about those different things from cool things like the tool changer in this video to getting to finally do garage tours or space tours uh, of different people's creative space where they're able to build cool things. Uh, this being our first episode, I kind of wanted to give a primer. Um, it really shows, but in true Makers on Tap fashion, I wanted to still put it out. Um, it's gonna be rough. And it shows that it was our first episode. There was a lot of things that we had to learn um, along the way and tried to figure out throughout the process. Um, one of which is don't buy cheap lavaliers. Um, we tried to get a good audio solution, uh, but we kind of found out that that probably wasn't the thing that we should have gone with. Uh, and we will be fixing that going forward. The other things are... Unfortunately, we lost some of the video uh, and audio during some of this. And so I'm going to give you a bit, two bits of primer. Uh, one of which is we end up talking about a air pump solution that Joe talks about a lot that Jason came up with, which was an air pump that goes from the an air compressor into the tool head. And how that goes through is it goes through the back of it into the tool pickup. And then when the tool pickup picks up the tool head, the tool head then has a quick connect that then blows air onto there. And this is so you can escape having to use a fan solution. And you'll hear about a little bit why a fan solution is kind of not the best in some scenarios for the tool changer. Uh, the other thing is we completely missed the microscope calibration. And I know this is something that a lot of people wanted us to be able to show and kind of see how this actually works and what the process actually is for this working. Um, what I can tell you is that most likely me and Joe are actually going to sit down and do a more in-depth video about this, where we can show off kind of the finer details, get a view of the, or the, the software with like OBS. So that way you can see what's happening in real time between the two different things. So we definitely will retouch on these things in the video. We really only touched on in a minute, but you do hear us mention it. Uh, in the past tense when we talk about it. And basically what that was, was Joe got a microscope off Amazon that was a USB microscope. He had a printed uh, little plate that he could put on the printer bed, and then he would lower the, uh, the hot end so that it would line up in the crosshairs of the microscope and then log that information into the next tool and try and get as close as possible for each one of those tool heads. So that way they would be able to do it. Again, that's a rough explanation. And we will be doing a more in-depth explanation uh, in another video where we can talk a little bit more about the fine parts of the tool changer uh, in this small series that we're doing on the tool changer. Also, uh, we say it multiple times, but another great resource is Renee. Uh, if you have a chance, go check out their videos. Uh, to be able to see all the cool stuff that they're doing. I believe Joe does mention that they do have a uh, microscope video on their channel as well. Um, so if you want to get real quick information about that, then that would be a great resource for you to go ahead and go check out. And the last thing is, is just kind of a question. Um, do you guys want us to still do this? Uh, we kind of say it at the end of this. And we're hoping to get feedback which way it goes. Again, this is rough. It's going to be really rough. But if it's something that you guys want, then we'll find a way. Uh, we'll find a way to make it better by trial and error. Uh, we're makers. And sometimes that means that it isn't the prettiest, but we're always going to try um, until we can get it to work and get what the community wants. So... Without further ado, here's the first episode of Between Two Makers. All right, hopefully that picked up on all of the mics. All right, are we calling this Between Two Makers? I think we got to I, at I, this point. I think we should. Because this could be a thing. We could like do this. I, 
it's gonna be interesting. Well, we could do that with this and the pro, and like we're gonna get the Bontom. Well, and um, then we could just like bring on cool machines. Mm -hmm. Like, well, it, like the the fun thing will be to be able to like bring on like the thirty and do the build race. Oh, God. Like, <laughs> I think that would be really fun. Yes, garage, um, the garage needs to be clean. Here we have all the tools. True. True. <laughs> like <laughs> this shop is like um, it's like Dom's workshop in the first Fast and the Furious. If you're building the machine, and you can't find the right tool in here. You don't belong touching the machine. <laughs> I need to watch. I need to watch Fast and Furious again. <laughs> yeah, it's been too long since I've like watched the first one. I just like only am remembering all of like the so good. ones in between. <laughs> so good. okay. So how do we want to? <laughs> Hello, Internet, and welcome to a little bit something we're doing different. Uh, normally, you only hear our voices, but today you get to see our beautiful faces. Uh, I am Chris, and this is Joe, and we're going to be doing a little thing. We're gonna we're gonna trial call between two makers. Um, and in which we hope to deep dive into different pieces of tech uh, between printers and other cool stuff that may be coming out that we are able to get our hands on. Um, we're hoping to kind of do some deep dives on some cool stuff. Or projects we're making too. There's some stuff out of frame that I'm super excited about. I mean, there's stuff like behind me that I want you to like get to and be able to show off. Yeah. Um, in case you can't tell, we're in my workshop right now. So this is like the beginning of that promise that we made like two years ago to do workshop tours. So like, yeah, you see a quarter of my workshop um, <laughs> and it's clean. We're in that quarter. We're like, <laughs> yeah, dude, it, like this year has been interesting. It's It's both been a long and trialless year but also really exciting because we've we've had kind of that renewed maker energy in some areas oh, yeah. um between doing the virtual ones and doing all of the other cool stuff we're kind of getting that spark to to create in different ways again which has yeah. been really fun um so this is something of that um and today we're going to be taking a look at e3d's tool changer I'm going to be asking some questions to Joe uh, and getting kind of some kind of some feedback and being able to start a little bit of a dialogue and just kind of getting more information on what the tool changer is and all of the cool stuff about it. Yeah. So, it, yeah. You you made an a interesting point there. You said E3D's tool changer. And one of the things that I want you guys to take away from this video is that while E3D built the platform, there are no two tool changers on the planet that are the same. So while this was E3D's platform, this is very much Makers on Tap Joe's tool changer. This is my iteration of it. Um, it's a conglomeration of a lot of things. And um, so uh, as we go through this Q&A today, some of this stuff is my opinion and how I've gotten through some of this stuff. Um, E3D gave us some answers to some of your questions. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's there's some support there. And, yeah, we're going to try to get as much information to our community as we can. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that's kind of the cool thing is just, like, not a, like when Murph was a thing and you were able to bring this, I believe that there was, like, two or three that were there. Yeah. And all of them were different. And oh, that yeah. Was, that was awesome to be able to see it. And even now that E3D is releasing more like tools and other things for you to be able to attach, it's gonna get even more diverse, which makes it even more fun yeah. to tailor to whatever project you're working on. Yeah, and as we get into several hundred machines in the wild and several hundred machines working, we're starting to see more and more community support, more and more community iterations. There's starting to be uh, pull requests for slicers specifically dedicated to this machine. It's really, really cool uh, to see how everybody's attacking all of this. Right. So. so I guess the first question I'd have right off the bat would be, uh, is it functional right out of the box? <laughs> no, no, no. 
Um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, Darby Dragons here. This is um, not your first machine. It's not even your second machine. Uh, if it's your third build, you probably succeed pretty well. Um, if you're the type of person that sees like a Voron kit or a Railcore kit and you're like, that seems like a cool weekend or month, <laughs> um, you are the type of person that will succeed in the E3D tool changer. If you are the type of maker that's like, I'm going to buy the pre-assembled Prusa because I need it to work, don't buy this. Just don't. And um, everybody at E3D will straight up tell you that too. If you call support and you tell them that you want this to work, they'll tell you not to buy it. And it's just because it's it's not geared towards you. Um, this is the beginning of a revolution, uh, per se. Like uh, Sanjay said it best one year. Um, you know, we figured out how to make three-axis machines pretty well. Like we can make a tool head go back and forth. So we had to make the problem a lot harder. <laughs> and um, okay, it's it's still hard. Um, you know, the slicer supports barely there. Uh, firmware support has gotten so much better in the last year and a half. Um, the beta group for this, which this was the second one in the US, I missed it by one day because FedEx screwed me. Um, I would have had the first, uh, but the, you know, when we first got these machines, there was no support. And uh, Tony from Duet and uh, David Crocker from uh, Reparat Firmware just poured their heart and soul into this machine for a year with the rest of the other 30 or so beta testers. And we made a really functional community out of it and um, a really awesome machine. So no, it doesn't work out of the box. And no, it's not a printer out of the box. It is a motion platform that is capable of becoming a printer with some blood, sweat, and tears, literally. Well, okay, <laughs> that's completely fair. Um, I mean, on the tails of a printer, then what, how many colors can you print with this? Um, uh, okay. So there are four slots for tool heads. Um, so you could print four colors or four different materials. If you have four tool heads, notice there's an empty slot here. There used to be four tools on this machine. Uh, I recently completely redid the whole machine from the ground up and only rebuilt three tools because there's a new tool uh, that was just coming out at the time as I was building it, and I just haven't gotten around to finishing it. So that's why there's still a slot here. Um, there has been discussion of people running Pallet Pros on the tool heads. So like at that point, you know, you 16 if you really wanted to be crazy about it. Uh, I don't know how the slicer support works for that, um, but there is you know four as it's stock. Okay. Well, I mean, with people adding a whole bunch of uh, different tool heads and stuff like that, what are the print temps that it can get to to be able to su successfully print those kind of materials? Well, what kind of materials? Um, so, like I said, it's a build it to your spec machine. So when you buy the E3D kit, it comes with a tool head that has an aluminum block, a brass nozzle, and a thermistor, a standard uh, thermistor. So, you know, you're limited at 300 ish C at that point. Yeah. But, um, you know, this tool head has a nozzle X, has a titanium heat break, has a copper block and a Hamera on it. I there's, and P and a PT 100, uh, thermal sensor. There's no reason I couldn't print 500 degrees C on this tool head. Um, you know, so that at that point we start talking about like engineering materials, right? Like, right. Um, you know, way beyond nylon, which I print all the time on this machine, way beyond polycarbonate, which I print very often on this machine. Uh, but I think one of the one of the common, and I think that you're leading into one of the common materials that people always ask is, can I print peak or peck on this yeah. machine? No, you can't. I know Greg does, and I know <laughs> um, that E3D has commercials about it. Like, ah, oh, carbon fiber pecs, the future. It totally is. Um, there are grades of peak and peck that don't need an enclosure that can be post annealed. I don't know where you can get them, though, without a government contract that says that you can have it. 
So, um, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. A, once those materials start getting released to the public, sure. But this machine, as it sits, is not designed to be enclosed. It's not designed to be an oven. Now, my machine has all polycarbonate side panels because during the beta spec, side panels were not standard with the machine. They were going to be an option until we found out that you had to have them. Uh, so I made all polycarbonate panels for most of the beta testers. And um, you know, so because of that, my panels are more heat resistant than the acrylic panels. Um, but you know, we still have non-heat rated linear rails, non-heat rated um, stepper motors. You know, so you can enclose it and use the heat generated by your heated bed uh, to do things like ABS and polycarbonate no problem but if we're going to start pumping in like enclosure heaters to do uh, things like PEC or Ultim it's not going to go well without some major redesign. So it sounds like a really like really specialized piece of equipment that's able to do a lot of different things um, and it kind of sounds a little bit up there what what kind of software do you have to be able to use to interface with it for like slicing and stuff like that? For slicing, you can use any conventional slicer. Um, the holdbacks are you need to be able to slice for the amount of tools you will be able to use. So things like Idea Maker that can only slice for two tools, you can only slice for two nozzles. Um, the supported slicer out of the box is Simplify 3D. Uh, that is what E3D posts profiles for on their GitHub. Um, I don't use Simplify 3D anymore. I used to use it, uh, but I found that I like to use Prusa Slicer better. Uh, Prusa Slicer does have some holdups, though, uh, because of how the post-processing scripts are done. There's a little bit of background knowledge that you need. And um, because of how RepRap firmware works, the post-processing scripts are absolutely needed. Um, with RepRap firmware, M104 and 109, which is your tool heat up and standby or, or wait until fully heated commands, are they're deprecated. They're no longer used. They are replaced with a G10 command that uses uh, G10S, which is your active tool, and an R, which is your standby temp. And um, we do that for each of the tools individually, and that all gets posted back into the firmware so that each tool as it gets picked up, we don't need to tell it what temperature to heat up anymore. Firmware's already got that in the background. So we have to strip out the M104 and 109 commands for that to work properly. And I just did that with a simple Python script that does a search and replace. Um, I search out M104, 109, replace them with a blank line. You know, after that, Prusa Slicer works amazing. Um, there has been some recent interest in looking into Kira. Uh, I recently found out from running the Taz Pro that Kira does predictive heat ups. So instead oh. of like waiting for your tool to heat up from standby temp, it will early on be like, oh, we're going to call the tool pretty soon. Better start heating that guy up and it starts heating up. So I'm going to start digging into that pretty soon here uh, with Adam. And um, yeah, so slicing is simple um, because of as long as you handle everything in the firmware. So when I set up a new Prusa slicer, my start G code is make sure there's no tool loaded, home, set my active and standby temps for each active tool. And then um, if I'm going to use tool zero first, you have to input a tool zero manually. It doesn't do tool zero automatically because it just expects that tool zero is always selected. Okay. And tool zero, T zero is how it gets called uh, to go pick the tool. And that's it. That's all I have in my custom G code is those like six lines. And then my end command is put the tool away and shut off all my heaters. That's all I do special in my slicing. Um, Wow. Okay. So what it like starting off, where can you find the tools to be able to get it going right away? Like you've got all your tools on there, you know, at least the settings for those, where can you get the, the tools to put those into the slicing software? 
Um, so there's been some people recently that have posted some uh, profiles to GitHub. Uh, I think uh, Paul Arden is one uh, that has done it. And uh, pretty soon, there's supposed to be a native uh, Prusa slicer support. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, the the G10 command thing is going away uh, pretty quick here. And um, there will be some uh, pre-done slicing profiles done by Paul and Rene Drac. Ooh, okay. Yeah, they'll be good. Um, yeah. I'm really, I'm really excited. Rene, everything Rene does is... No, that'll be really awesome to see that uh, like such an up and coming like slicing software that's really started to finally gain traction and be usable and yeah. be awesome is also going to start branching out even more. Cool. Um, and there was a recent announcement that the Prusa XL is going to have tool changing. Really? Yeah, you didn't see that. Did I you? did that not. Was, yeah. Okay. okay. So um, I'm very excited for that purely because now they're going to be developing towards tool changing in Prusa Slicer. It will be, you know, we always hoped Papio would be the way. Because right. Papio was developed by E3D at the same time this was happening and tool changing support was excellent. Yeah. Papio. Um, <laughs> so, you know, now we have that and I'm hoping that will do a lot for us. Yeah. Um, the other slicer that is kind of up and coming and like, has a downfall at the same time is uh, Fusion 360 Slicer. Uh, that is what is supported for the Assemble project or ASMBL, um, which is the subtractive tool head that should be right here right now. Um, the problem with it is that they don't support multi tool head for FDM yet. Okay. Um, but that is in the works. So, uh, E3D has a slicing profile for the tool changer and has a machine profile for it on GitHub. And um, that's all accessible and it works. I've printed with it, but um, it doesn't do multi tool head yet. So, so what, like, what kind of um, scripts and stuff do you need in order to be able to use the uh, assemble or other tool heads like that? Um, is that all provided by E3D or is the community really stepped up to be able to make that easily available? So for a symbol is a monster all on its own. Okay. Um, and that software is all available. Uh, it was written by an awesome guy named Andy that works for E3D. Um, and it's all available on GitHub and open source. Uh, but for outside tool heads, um, I've seen people talk about like glue guns, uh, lasers, um, you know, anything like that. All that's kind of on your own. It's kind of roll your own. Um, there's, that's why this was developed for people to make weird crap to put on 3D printers. Yeah. And um, you know, it, it allows you to easily adapt that stuff, but easily is a misnomer. You know, it's, it's easy for a researcher or easy for somebody who's really damn smart to do it. It might not be easy for an 11 year old in their bedroom tinkering around or somebody who's just getting started in like 3D printing. Um, basically the hooks are there if you know where to look. And that's that's kind of how this stuff is, has gone. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of bring this up because it may be a little bit off, but you've hinted at it a couple times right out the bat, is this a hobbyist machine? Like, is this something that somebody who's just really into 3D printing and wants to do this, or is this more a tool for a specific kind of job? Yes. Um, so like hobbyist means a lot of things, right? Hobbyist could mean that you want to dig in, you want to tinker and figure out how to do all this stuff and how to get into the background of, of Duet and hook all this stuff in or hobbyist means that you do this on the weekends and you don't want to do that. Um, if you do this on the weekends and you don't want to figure that, don't buy the machine. But if you, that's like what gets you up in the morning is figuring out how to make robots tick, you will love this thing because there's so many mysteries to solve. Uh, it's why I have it. You know, I, I don't 3d print things that aren't machine parts typically because I'm not, I'm, I'm not somebody who's like, ah, oh, I'm gonna 
make the best scorpion bust anybody has ever seen and tweak this profile to the nth degree. Um, I, I see you and we've <laughs> talked, um, but you know, I, that's not me. I want to figure out how to make the machine do weird stuff. Yeah. I, every machine in the shop I've built and like spent way too much time trying to figure out how to tweak firmware to do weird things that it shouldn't do. Um, that's what I'm interested in. So you know, if that's you, you will love this thing. If you want to tweak slicer profiles, you might, if you still like working on machines. Well, fair enough. So, so talking about the firmware and, and getting all of that ready for this, what about tool pickups and wipes? How does that handle that? So um, that's one thing that people get really tripped up on. Uh, they try to handle all that stuff in Slicer with like the tool scripts and stuff or in Simplify. Don't do that. Don't, don't hurt yourself. Like, there's no reason to handle all of that stuff there. That's what Duet does for you. And that's why we're using Duet for this project. Um, all of that stuff should be handled in firmware. And the best part of Duet is we can change those scripts on the fly without recompiling, without even stopping the job. If I don't like how a tool is being picked up or put back, I can change that G code and then the next time it runs, it's live on the fly. And that is like the, the, the superpower of Duet for making weird machines do. Like, yeah. Okay, um, okay. So I there's, mean... j just to like high level it, not get too deep into the weeds. There's three scripts. There's a T pre, a T post, and I can't remember the other. I always forget. Um, pre runs bef right as the tool pick happens. Um, the next one, darn. The next one is <laughs> what actually uh, occurs it, when the tool's been picked. So it's your purge or any of your wiping that happens yeah. every time. And then um, the last one is the script that happens when the tool gets put back. Okay. And I can't remember what it is now. Fair it's, enough, fair it's, enough. It is what it is. There, there's there three be a there. There's editor's note like right below yeah. you right now that says this is what it is because we thought of it three days later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, and we can look it up too. But you know, <laughs> those, those three things are what control all of that stuff. So for um, wiping, all three of these tools have little docks where they dump in and the filament just falls to the bottom and makes a giant mess and they wipe on their way out of the dock and then they're ready to print. Fair enough. Um, I mean, it sounds like Duet's like kind of the end all be all for a lot of this because it really helps you be able to use the machine. But is that what you have to use for being able to use the tool changer? No, uh, you absolutely don't. Uh, but you should, um, unless you really, unless you really like digging around in firmware. Um, and then Clipper is a really amazing option because Clipper lets you run no end of um, microprocessing units, all from a computing source like a Raspberry Pi or even a laptop. And it does a lot of these really cool tool scripts and all of that stuff. It's just a little more complicated to dig into, um, but Clipper is ultra powerful. It's what people like Rob Mink have used that have like the 13 tool tool changers yeah. uh, that were at Earth the last year Earth happened. Um, Clipper is ultra powerful. Uh, Marlin, I'm not really sure where Marlin stands for all of this. The uh, developer for Marlin got a beta unit and has contributed a ton to the project in general, that's Scott. Uh, but I don't know, I don't know where Marlin stands with tool changing right now. Okay. Um, board wise, you need a board that supports as many extruders, heaters, and tool and part fans as you can get. So like the Duet and the expansions are really powerful for that. Uh, but like um, Big Tree Tech has the GTR Pro or whatever that has like 36 things and has all their expansions. So you could do that with Clipper and it would work great. Uh, it all depends on what you're comfortable with. Uh, for me, Duet has been amazing for all of this. Right. And um, the updates have been really fast. Uh, David's been really supportive of the project as a whole. And Duet is making 
tool changer centric hardware like the tool boards with the CAN bus and do a three and all that stuff. So, um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lots of cool stuff. That's a just that the community is getting so quickly behind this because they, they see this as something that's coming and that's awesome. And that really speaks of the RepRep community and all that they've been able to do. Yeah. Um, speaking of RepRep, though, like, what would you run on this? Would you run two or three uh, running with it? So RepRep firmware currently on the Duet 2 Wi-Fi, which is what I'm running here. Um, it can run Duet or RepRep firmware 2 or 3. And out of the box, E3D supports RepRep firmware 2. I went through the hassle of updating the RepRep Firmware 3. Uh, so far I've seen no ill effects. I'm running 3.1.1 and um, everything is running really, really well. I like the newer Duet web interface that comes with RepRep 3, uh, which is part of why I went to it. The config file is quite a bit different. So um, if you're not comfortable digging around in the config file, I recommend going with what E3 ships you. Uh, but it's not that hard. It took me about two hours to debug everything. And where it becomes difficult is if you're running non-standard heater sensors like uh, PT100s. So real quickly, we're about to jump into the next thing, but what is the max current draw on, on this? I, gotta, I gotta look at my phone because I want to get these numbers right. Yeah. Um, a couple of people asked this. Uh, it is a... 800 watt bed if you are using the Mordor bed and not the uh, very power bed like I'm using. And a 400 watt PSU is what they ship with the kit. So it should at most be 1200 disk watts. Um, my machine's using a 500 watt PSU and that's it uh, because I'm okay. running a 24 volt machine. So, you know, a 110 outlet, that's all you need. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay. So now we're gonna, get into some of the mechanical stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring my phone out because there is a good <laughs> amount here. You were right. Uh, There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're gonna the the I should say the reason that we're referring to our phones and we are trying to be a little bit professional and whatnot, trying to be all snazzy. But like a lot of these questions were submitted by the community and we want to make sure that we we get them right and we we are answering the questions that the community had. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna read some of these off, and I'm gonna have Joe answer a lot of these, uh, so that way you get the answers that you wanted. Um, another great resource for you to be able to check out uh, is no shameless plug, but our Discord. Um, our Discord has a, a tool changer uh, channel right in there uh, for you to be able to come in and ask questions and, and get some answers. Is it the best? No, E3D does have their own Discord <laughs> and you can probably go there. But if you want to see our friendly faces and get really goofy answers, you bet you can find them there. <laughs> you know, we say that, but like Greg and Andy from E3D are in our Discord and they yeah. pop in. Renee pops in all the time. Um, uh, Eric Setterberg pops in all the time. So like the people that are gonna answer your questions anyway are hanging out with us too. Yeah, we, we started that channel to generate questions for this video and then it just turned into a discussion forum and it was way too hard to comb through to find all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good time though, no, it's a good enough, time. <laughs> so let's start it off. Uh, what are all, what is all needed and are all parts included? Uh, so all of the metal stuff is included, um, but they're all the printed parts. So like all these little cable guys and these things, uh, none of that's included in the kit. So you gotta have a 3D printer to start. Um, the There's also all kinds of little gotchas throughout the build guide. Like uh, you use thread lock a lot, you use super glue sometimes and super glue has to cure. Um, there's, uh, one section where you need to lube up uh, this the rod that this gear is mounted to. And you better lube that, like when you think that you've lubed it enough, do it two more times because uh, the action of this moving in and out is critical to the function of the tool changer. And this little guy doesn't have enough uh, torque to overcome any anything else. So like, yeah, do it a lot. Um, but, uh, 
And, and none of that stuff's listed in the guide up front. It's just like sprinkled throughout. It's little 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 gotchas along the way. It's little little fairies like tripping you on the trail. <laughs> Um, fair enough, fair enough. You know, and, and you always come across that stuff at like 12.30 at night, and you're like, I'm going to get this. Nope, not going to get this done tonight. Um, so what uh, Adam Hiley and I have been working on is a doc site called toolchanger.xyz. And um, and if I got that wrong, we'll fix it. <laughs> uh, but it's basically Adam got a tool changer kit and we spent like a week and a half on Facebook Messenger just talking about how to make the docs better, what's missing, what's unclear. And uh, it's been fun because I've been able to provide all of that feedback back to the Tool Changer support team at E3D. And then at the same time, we're doing this GitHub docs site where we're listing things like you're going to need grease and you're going to need this and you're going to need these size Allen wrenches to get through these steps. And uh, trying to make it as good as we can. Totally open to community contributions, community support. Um, we're going to have slicing profiles and stuff like that on it. And it's just, the it, goal is to be a good resource. So fair enough. When it comes to using the Z Pro, a lot of people have had questions about how it exactly works. Um, can you explain that a little bit of what kind of goes on? Yeah, sure. So Z Pro mounted hard mounted right here. It's just a micro switch. And we can do that because it's not, there's nothing actually hard mounted with the tools. So the tool length doesn't matter. This pins or probes position always stays constant. And, um, you know, it's just home the machine real quick so you guys can see the switch in action. But, um, all of our tool lengths are set from that switch position. That switch position is Z0. And then in our config, there is a different G10 command than the temperature G10 command. Way too much that G10 does. Fair enough, fair um, enough. And all that does is it sets an XYZ offset for the tool. So for most of my tools, they're all about the same length. They have a negative I think they're like a negative 4.7 degree or 4.7 millimeter offset because the tool or the nozzle is about four millimeters below that switch. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. The, um, okay. Can you have extruders with wildly different Z offsets on the same system? For example, the standard V6 and a super volume. Absolutely, because of that thing that we just said. Um, the G10, it, it can be anything, and it becomes active as soon as the tool is picked up. So remember earlier we talked about the tool scripts, the, yes. the pre, and then the post? Yes. Um, maybe it's pre, post, ah, pre, post, and free. Pre, post, and free. Yeah, pre okay. happens in machine coordinates with no offset connected so there's no tool on the head post happens with tool coordinates active okay and that's the key tool coordinates set that distance so um in the post command it is active as soon as the tool head is here uh picking up the tool what you should have in that post command is a z a negative z drop long enough to accommodate that tool length Okay. So for most of my tools, even though they're like five millimeters, I set that Z at like 20 because I have heard the sound that it makes when a block catches the bed as it's undocking. And I don't ever want to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, so I, I make that offset you know, nice and long. But if you had like a super volcano, there's no reason why you couldn't make that Z like 100 millimeters. Right. But really what it should be is something sane like 10 because as soon as it docks to pick up that super volcano tool that offsets active and it says oh z just changed by 100 millimeters so i have to accommodate for that plus 10. okay and that's how that extra tool ha length happens and it's it's so slick it's what made me want to build the idex printer last year like Fair once enough. i figured out how all of the tool uh coordinates worked it's just like oh oh we can build 
an IDEX printer or a dual extrusion printer, and I can tweak all these offsets on the fly by just changing this command and then <laughs> re-inputting it in con... Mm, yes, that's what I want to do. So... I mean, it makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, and I still want to build it. I'll get around to it one of these days. One of these days? Yeah, I have the boards. <laughs> so when it comes to um, using stuff like a... Uh, BMG and a mosquito. Can you use those on on the tool changer? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's sacrilegious. <laughs> just you just ruin every. Yeah, you totally can. Um, Wade from Mandala Toolworks makes a really nice mosquito mount uh, for the original uh, tool changer uh, Bowden heads. Um, there have been a few people that have used BMGs for the Bowden tools. Uh, but I haven't seen anybody do a BMG direct drive yet. Um, it, I think that's because a BMG would require a V6, okay. and that just eats up a ton of Z. Um, and it, the hard part is your, your tool dock, the key position, can never change, right? Because right? This, this can't go up and down. Right. So when you change a dock's w when a dock needs to get taller or shorter, you have to change where the forks land. So okay. when you're docking a tool, there's these two forks. And um, you know, for these, I had to gain some more Z, so I had to lift them up. So there's these printed uh, lift and extend things that change where it mounts to. Okay. Normally, it would mount right to the plate. So you have to accommodate for that. And you know, if you extend the tool out, if the crossbar is going to hit, you have to extend them all out. So it has right. to be like a holistic plan of attack. Um, but I, I'd be curious to see somebody do a direct drive BMG just for like morbid curiosity. But uh, I haven't seen anybody do it yet. Fair enough. Uh, why is the build surface rectangular at 200 by 300? Okay, so this was a Rene Dirac question, and I'm pretty sure it was a joke. <laughs> don't know. Uh, what I would guess is that the original big box dimensions were 200 by 300. Yes. And this, this was partially based off of some of that stuff. Sort of. I mean, Greg designed them both. Right. I, so I have a feeling that it has some weird thing to do with like how Greg feels about dimensions. <laughs> okay. Just, just like knowing Greg and like hearing his reasoning for things. I bet there's like some weird thing that he wanted to print and he was just like, nobody ever needs to print bigger. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, a big part of uh, like a reasonable reason is Core XY gets kind of unwieldy after 300 by 300. Okay. And they wanted this to be a super solid, super fast design platform that doesn't take up a ton of space, but is still functional. Right. Um, it's very rare that I can't fit even client parts on this bed. And then, you know, when, when I do, I've got the Sig Max sort of that kind of works. Um, but, you know, usually if I find something that like can't fit on this bed, I just like, crank it at a weird angle and then build it at a bed of supports and that's really good. So, yeah. Fair enough. So when it comes to uh, getting new tools on that, what is the, what is the swappability of the tools? Uh, okay, so you, the, the big things that are holdups are uh, one just cable thing, um, firmware uh, would be a holdup. Uh, so you, know, you would have to make sure that it was all the same, uh, like heat sensors and fans and, and that type of stuff. Uh, these are all set up with quick disconnects, uh, Molox connectors inside this loom, so I could change it out if I ever wanted to. It's mostly a maintenance thing for me. Fair enough. Um, the uh, the CAN boards are supposed to help with that, but um, they're still not hot swappable, and these are definitely not hot swappable. If you want to kill your stepper drivers on your Duet, unplug them live. That's a good idea. Fair enough. <laughs> when it comes to uh, some of the community has talked about using pogo pins, uh, what is your opinion on that? So pogo pins are the little gold-plated pins that you'd like set a phone dock into in the late 2000s or something. Uh, they're really good for low current, uh, low cycle count things like charging a phone. Uh, for this, where we need a lot of current, we need very expensive pogo pins. They, they get kind of big. 
Um, but the main problem with them is, is they're usually only rated up to like 100,000 or a million cycles. And I get that that sounds like a lot, but a four color print on this thing that is like 800 mil or 800, uh, like 200 millimeters tall uh, at like a reasonable layer height, it's a few thousand tool changes. Right. So, um, well, we were even talking about this guy, um, like your, your chalice. Um, yeah. I think that was like 7,000 tool changes. Yeah. For one print. Yeah. Like that's... So <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy. Um, and you know, it, so that turns into, uh, there was some math that Eric did. It's like a hundred four color prints at 0.1 layer height. Right. At full. So you know, the life is not good enough. So when it comes to having something that's reliable, um, that holds the the tool head and everything like that, um, what happens when that doesn't work? What happens when a tool drops? So um, since I've converted to the retail spec, I haven't had a tool drop. Okay. Uh, on the beta spec, I had a little micro switch here that told me whether or not a tool was present. And uh, when a tool dropped, it would come, park the head, cool all the tools down and put everything in standby mode and just wait. Um, and I haven't implemented that yet in this, um, but that is the expected behavior is that you would set that up. For some reason, E3D doesn't give you that capability out of the box. Like the STLs aren't available. I'm not sure what's up with that, but um, it's definitely capable. It's problematic though, and that's probably why they didn't do it. Uh, I would get some false drops or some false, like oh. it would, I would have a drop and it wouldn't detect it. Right. So it's not 100% reliable, but that's that's really the way to do it. Um, you know, so in case you do get a tool drop, it's important to keep the bottom of your printer clean so that you don't drop a hot, hot end into a pile of plastic. Yeah. <laughs> no, fair enough. Like what when, when you're putting things on it and you're you're getting new tools, how do you put a new tool on there if you wanted to add like a specialized tool like a hot glue gun or something like that? How would you go about that process? Um, so all the files are available on GitHub. Uh, the first thing I do is build a assembly in Fusion or your CAD software of choice. They're all available as steps. Um, so and can it out and then you know, figure out the I.O. that you need. There's lots of I.O. available on the duets. There's lots of GPIO pins, uh, PWM outputs. Like You can drive just about anything. You just have to figure out how to do it. Um, and to do weird stuff like that, the duet form is available and the E3D form are both good resources with uh, the right types of people and minds to figure that stuff out. Fair enough. When it comes to um, deciding between some of the duets uh, and your firmware and all of that, why is uh, the Duet 3 the one that you went with? I didn't. I went with, uh, well, Duet 3 wasn't out yet when I built this. Okay. And it was the Duet 2 Wi-Fi. And it's still, I still would recommend the 2 Wi-Fi over the 3 for this machine um, because the 3 was built it's way overbuilt for a 3D printer, for one. It was built to drive large machines. So it's got like four amp drivers. It's got the TMC 5160s. Um, it's got all the connectors are a lot bigger. Um, and uh, it runs off of the uh, Raspberry Pi 4 for its interface, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's not needed for this unless unless you decide that you want to use Canvas and the tool boards. Tool boards require a Hamera, well, require a Hamera, but the Canvas basically makes it so that instead of running 15 wires through this loom, you run one wire with a connector. Ah, and okay. all of your heat, power, and information runs through that tool board. The problem with the tool board that I have is um, it's expensive. They're about $35 a piece. And so $150-ish for boards after you buy all four. Right. And um, it rides on the front of the Hamera. So not this side, but the other side. Yeah. And uh, this machine's not perfect. Occasionally a tool drop happens. I haven't had a tool drop in a really long time, uh, but occasionally a tool drop happens 
and it drops onto an aluminum plate down here and that board's expensive and it's the first thing that hits every time mm. <laughs> that sounds about right <laughs> and uh, there's there's just not a lot of room in the front here for like armor or right. something it's right. you know you're pressing the Hemera right up against the uh, polycarbonate so that's my only reason like, against the tool boards other than they but they work awesome and um, the wiring is nice so. Fair enough. So E3D has recently released a new tool for this, um, making this a even more fun project to dive into. And we've we've said it a couple times, hinted at it a couple times, and that is Assemble, uh, which has been their newest, coolest thing that's come out. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, it is not an assembly tool for the machine. It is in fact a deassembly tool. It's a subtractive head. Um, and uh, it's kind of been the purpose of the tool changer since the beginning was to do hybrid manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, so you, you have your additive manufacturing and then you can cut things away to either make the quality better or the um, precision better, whatever. Um, and uh, the, the big advent of this was the software. Um, you know, anybody can do a little brushless spindle or a Dremel or something like that, but it's always been difficult to have the software implementation happen. And that's where the real power of uh, Assemble or ASMBL, however you want to say it, uh, came. So that's been something that they've been working on for like a year now. Yeah. Um, and uh, they recently released it in the summertime. I can't remember exactly when. Um, when they released it, was there a kit for it, or what's what's the process of putting it on there? No, there isn't a kit. There's a, a Thingiverse thing that Greg released uh, that uses a lot of very hard to get parts, like a three millimeter ID um, sixteen tooth GT two pulley to drive the spindle itself almost impossible to get. There's like two places in the world. And when I ordered mine, I ordered it and it took like four months to get here. I didn't think it was ever coming. Uh, and the okay. other option was to pay like $40 for the pulley, uh, which I wasn't about to do because I wasn't sure how soon I was going to get it done. That's the whole. Um, so, you know, here's all the stuff for an ASMBL head. It's all here except the time to build it, um, and I'll get to it. I will, I totally will. Uh, there's three people that have built them. I haven't seen many people use them yet. I think I've seen one other person other than Greg use it. Um, but it's, you know, it's a very, it's a very interesting concept and I'm really excited to dig into it. It's just gonna take some dedicated time that I haven't had. So I mean, that's it. So that is the question. Then, so you want to build it? So is it is it worth building? Absolutely. Uh, but you know, the RB Dragons here. It's it's one step deeper into the quagmire of the the tool changer. Like, um, you know, the the Fusion three hundred and sixty plugin is pretty good. Um, it's not perfect yet. Uh, there's some really funny stories that Greg has about just like diving the cutter into the print bed. Anybody who's ever ran a CNC machine has stories about diving the cutter into whatever they're cutting. Uh, it's just you know, especially fun to hear it on a printer. Um, so there's, you know, there, there's lots of stuff going on there that I'm excited to dig into. And I think you should too. There needs to be more of these heads out there because the only way to get things better is to have more people do it uh, and experiment with it. Absolutely. You said uh, Fusion has a little bit of a tooling guide for it. Um, what are the slicers that are kind of out there for it right now? So there's, uh, you can do everything with a single color and a single cutting head in Fusion. If you need to do dual colors or dual materials or whatever, uh, there is a script that merges Simplify 3D print code with Fusion 360 subtractive code. Uh, okay. that Andy wrote, and uh, that works pretty well. So that's uh, those are the two that exist right now. I don't think there's any plans to dig into any other slicers at the moment. Fair enough. So when it comes to um, getting a little bit more customizable, when it comes to your mods, what have you done to it, and what do you suggest for that? Um, I suggest 
the first thing I suggest is a flex plate. Um, this is a modified TH3D flex plate. Um, there's some glue stick on it. Uh, but um, somebody needs to make a really good high temp magnetic flex plate for it. I'm looking at you, Wade, for Mandala Rose Works. <laughs> um, but somebody needs to make a really good flex plate. There was a big hole there. Um, and the really cool thing about a flex plate is, especially with a symbol, is you now have a steel plate protecting all of your sensitive printing bits. Right. Uh, that's sacrificial. Uh, so like this is a powder coated PEI bed. I probably wouldn't use this, but I also have some of the, um, I think TH3D has their easy mat. I have some plates yeah. with easy mat on it. You know, it's super sacrificial. I'm not going to hurt the steel. Right. So peel off the easy mat, put a new easy mat on. That, that's my plan for assemble uh, when I do it. The other mods that I highly recommend when you can buy them, do Hamera heads, just skip everything else and go to Hamera's. Uh, it made the printer so much better. Um, but the printed parts, I do recommend printing in SLA and not uh, FDM. Uh, because they're they're kind of tight tolerance and most of them are made to be tapped. So um, there are some really nice screws out there to tap into plastic that I, I think are the right way to go rather than tapping them with a standard M3 bolt, but uh, here they're there. The other mod that I recommend is skip the fans and go to an air pump, uh, like we talked about earlier, just because yeah. of the the firmware issues and, and trying to fit a good cooling duct and everything in. This is such a tight package. It's it's a really hard thing to do. And you know, I like cooling ducts that come from both sides, so you're not just cooling one side of the print. Um, and you know, good cooling is really matters a lot. Um, the other things. What did I? I had a list. Oh. Uh, Skip standard thermistors and go to PT-1000s or PT-100s. PT-1000s don't need an amplifier board, and therefore I recommend going with those. Um, but, uh, you know, even being able to go up to like 350 for polycarbonate yeah. is really nice. Uh, oh, and if you do direct drive, mount your spools above your machine. I have an above the machine spool holder. I'm building a rec box right now. Uh, that's going to go above the machine, but you, know, you end up with with the standard mount. You end up mounting your spools in here. It's kind of hard to get your spools in past the bed, and then they end up running through like a meter and a half of Bowden tube before they even get to the tool. Um, so there's a lot of drag created, and it's just a lot easier to swap all of your stuff in where you can run from the top. Right. Uh, but you have to run direct drive for that. So when it comes to some of the community and all the cool things that they've created, what have been some of the favorite mods that you've seen them do? So uh, Greg and then Renee did some mods to it, made a really cool uh, linear stepper driven brush that mounts right here uh, that adjusts height based on the tool length. It's really nice if you're running volcanoes or something and you want to be able to change that out. Um, Poof Jr. Uh, from the Jubilee project, he has written an open CV script that lets him do uh, all the microscope calibration I talked about earlier automatically. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Yeah. So um, there's, I know there's more work to be done on it, but it's getting there. Um, and, and it's stuff like that that I really want to see done. Um, lots of people have made cool little purge buckets like these. Uh, and I'm trying to think what else. Um, it, most of it's just like quality of life stuff. Yeah. Um, mounting the microscope somewhere on the printer or um, nice purge buckets and, and things like that. Those are the things that have really kind of stood out. Um, there's been a couple of people that have done drag knife cutters and, and, and things, but um, there hasn't been so much of that. I was hoping to see more like grippers and things come out and you know, I haven't contributed anything, so I don't have any room to talk. Uh, <laughs> but uh, other than just helping people get their tool changers going. Right, um, right. Yeah, those are the main things. Um, 
Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, ooh. Okay. So E3D um, also sent over some uh, questions and answers that they get a lot. Uh, and so we're going to kind of rapid fire through those uh, to kind of go through those. So I'm just going to be asking Joe and he'll just kind of be giving his off the cuff as well as some of the E3D answers that they've given us as well. Right. Um, but I will be running through those now. <laughs> so we're going to try and do this as rapid fire as possible. All right. First one, a uh, closed loop motion controller. I mean, you could, um, it's hard mostly because firmwares don't set it up. You don't need it. Uh, the steppers are really good, really damn good. Um, especially the ones that the retail version ships with, which I don't have, but, um, it's, we're, we're being off a half millimeter or even like a quarter of a millimeter means you crash when you dock a tool. I don't crash when I dock tools, so it, it's good enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, hot end height, what are the implications of using a mismatched tool uh, on a line bed tool holder positions except... Or except <laughs> we covered that one. Uh, the, the heights are set with G10s. Uh, yeah, to to do your tool height offsets, it's the same as any other printer. Uh, you know, you you jog the bed up until you you get the paper underneath it, and then you tell it how far off of zero it is. Um, yeah, fair enough. Uh, three millimeter or one point seven five mix. What is the current E three D wisdom here? E three D says not to do it. Joe says I've done it. And it works fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fair enough. Yeah, tool three was the only three millimeter tool head that's ever been in existence, I'm pretty sure. Um, worked fine. I just, I don't need it, so I'm not using it now. Fair enough. I'm doing a symbol head. Uh, Hamera issues. Direct drives will be important for some materials. What are problems known to date? Are kits available? Do, uh, do you need LNR versions or uh, two sides of the machine? Okay. Uh, no, there's no LNR version of a Hamera. They're all the same. You can put the tools in all four positions standard. Um, the main issue with Hamera is buying one. <laughs> That's Boy, the issue. That the truth. <laughs> um, there, there is an issue, uh, and it's a known issue, and I, there isn't a good fix for it. But um, with the fan in this position lined up with the poles of the motor, there's a solid chance that the fan won't spin. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, it took me 12 fans to find two that worked. Uh, wow. So, and that's, that's a known issue. Um, the ways of fixing it are move the fan to somewhere that's not aligned with the poles of the motor. I'm thinking up is a good way of doing yeah. it. Or don't use a fan. Um, which doesn't seem like a solution. It is a, it is a solution. You use an air pump. Well, um, that's fair. Okay. <laughs> the other known issues is I've had these four bolts loosen on me. They are threaded into a printed part. Um, mm. So I put some super glue on it and I called it good. And uh, it worked so far. Um, other than that, the Hamera heads have been flawless. They um, There is, I guess, another known issue where the weight of the Hamera induces ringing in the motion system. There's a really cool duet G code that will give you the ability to cancel out that based on specific frequencies. Interesting. Uh, it's in the default uh, duet config from E3D and it works. So, all right. Uh, physical tool replacement needs to be or needs to be able to swap in four tools uh, from a larger pool. What issues are involved? Quick disconnect of cabling, dismount of Bowden and extruders. And we kind of talked about this a little quick. So yeah, we covered that. Okay. Um, yeah. Duet three seems clearly supervised, or uh, duet three clearly superior uh, for complex use case. Will you have stock? What are issues known? Tool boards issues to dates and heater calibration. Uh, we talked about that a little bit too. It's it it's superior, but it's not. Uh, the Duet Two does like everything you really need it to do, except for the tool boards and CAN bus. 
And uh, in the nearish future, there's going to be some new Duet 3 based boards that handle that stuff for much, much cheaper than a Duet 3. Right. So, uh, wait. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, subtractive, have you seen the video slash blog post? What are learnings and issues to date? We just kind of talked about that as well. Yeah, there'll be um, dragons. Good luck. Let us know how it goes. <laughs> do it <laughs> if you're motivated to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, which slicer and what are the main trade-offs? We did that. We did that as well. Um... Uh, voltages, as I understand, it's necessary to select a motion control voltage, uh, a hot end voltage, and heater bed oh. uh, voltage. Um, so 24 volts all the way forever uh, until we can get more volts, more volts, more better. Uh, but the downfall of that is if you're using a symbol, you really should probably go down to a 12 volt power supply for the ESC. And you need to run a common ground. Uh, you should probably take basic electronics if you're going to do that and you have questions. Um, not being, I didn't know until I read it. So um, the, uh, oh, one thing with the slicer, uh, even with the purge buckets, run a purge shower. Just a little one, uh, but it helps get the material flowing at print speeds rather than purge speeds, which tend to be much faster, and you get less stringing. Um, I found it, Greg's found it, Hackney's found it, everybody's run a little purge jar. Fair enough. Uh, am I correct that a Z probe is on the carriage uh, and you uh, and you maintain tool offsets uh, uh, in the G code issues around Z probe with Duet 3 mainboard only? Uh, you don't do Z offsets in G code, you do Z offsets in config, G code, I guess. It is there. Uh, tool offsets in Duet or Rep Rep 3, they're not an issue. There was an issue with multi lead screw leveling. That's fixed. Okay. Uh, filament sensors. They exist. I'm not running them. Um, my experience with most of them is they're more problematic than they're worth. Uh, I do want to run runout sensors. There's like nine different types you can run on a duet. Pick one that works for you. The magnetic wheel has problems that I had trouble tuning out. That's the one I tried. I don't run it anymore. Fair enough. Uh, sweet, sweet spot combos of extruders, hot, hot ends, nozzles, and materials. I'm not familiar with the E3D product range, but assuming there are some well understood combos uh, to the base from, uh, and then need to work with nylon CF support, CP or uh, PC, PP, flex, and other engineering materials usually printed for particular components, speed rather than aesthetics. Nozzle X, one roll, nozzle rules them all. Polypropylene sucks anyway. Um, the, uh, the way I would do this if I was going to only be printing, uh, this would probably be a Volcano with a 0.8, and the rest of these would be 0.4. And the reason for that is COVID uh, and the rush to get as much stuff out as possible with what I had on hand taught me a whole lot about volumetric flow. And you can treat a 0.4 nozzle like a 0.6 nozzle if you slow down a little bit. Mm. Um, so the your print quality suffers a little bit, but 0.4 is super versatile. Um, and um, so what I would run is these two as Hamera 0.4s, this maybe as a Volcano 0.4, and this is a Volcano 0.8, or maybe a 0.6 in this one, um, and then run flexibles specifically through this one as the 0.6, something like that. Fair enough. Uh, thermal issues, if enclosed, what are known about potential issues with machine performance, dimensional stability, and operating or operated in, inside a heated enclosure? Heated enclosure is a bad idea. We talked about that. The yep. biggest thing is the thermal expansion of this bar will make it bow, probably. Uh, we did see that with carbon fiber. I don't know if we've seen it with the aluminum, but I know for sure we saw it with the carbon fiber bar. Okay. So, yeah, that's the biggest thing. Fair enough. Uh, wiping, purging issues, nozzle height, and variations. Yeah, we, we just kind of went that. over that. Yeah. <laughs> I 
Uh, and then uh, export to Jersey. Uh, need to verify what you can export uh, to the channel islands. Oh, that's that's export issues for E3D. We don't need to answer that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, overall. What else you got? What do what, you got? What, well, that's 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 what I'm kind of getting at. We, we've just... Like to give to give context, we've we've talked a lot. All the stuff that I've been asking again has been a lot of questions that uh, have come from the community, uh, and then a lot of the other questions are uh, E3D uh, gave them to us to to be able to help mm. answer and to be able to show out and kind of give to the, that to the community. Um, I've tried to like occasionally throw my own spin in there and whatnot, um, but like overall, like is it worth it? Yeah, uh, one thing we never talked about is how I use the machine. Right. Um, yeah, I, okay, so I rarely do multicolor prints. Occasionally I do multi material prints to mix support material. Um, but for the most part, what this machine is for me is four printers in one. And I think that, that is where the massive versatility for this machine comes from is, you know, I don't have to have, um, a machine with every nozzle in it. I don't have to do nozzle changes. Uh, I can, you know, this is set up specifically to run high temp engineering materials. This is set up specifically to run like PLA and stuff. Uh, so I can run very fine. Uh, this tool is set up to run flexibles. Um, it's, you know, I, I run all of these for my needs. Most of my paid projects come off of this printer. Uh, which is why I don't have a lot of projects to show. Uh, but you know, it's one of the nicest printers I have, uh, does the best job, and it's ultra reliable. I just I hit print and I walk away. So it like so, is that is that something that you've seen from a lot of a lot of the makers in the community is is that or is it has it been a lot of the frustrations of getting it up and running and and doing that? I, the people that have had a lot of frustration getting it up and running are the people that are they're not doing it the way I just explained it. Yeah, they're they're doing a lot of the stuff in slicers. They're they have a lot of trouble because they're they're just going about it the hard way instead of going about it the the way that the tools were intended to be used. Um, most of the problems that I've seen have been related to that. And then once they start working through understanding how the firmware should be used and understanding how the slicers should be gone about, they're pretty bulletproof. They work. They work good. Yeah. So. No, fair enough. Like, it's a fun machine. And I, I to give context, like, I didn't know a whole lot about the tool changer going into this. Um, in fact, I was really kind of actually hoping that I was going to win that contest and then us be able to like build another tool changer on the channel and be like, let's teach Chris about like what the hell a tool changer is. Yeah. Uh, cause I got to be there when it was unveiled mm -hmm. and got to see that. And that was really awesome. But like, I hadn't heard a whole bunch through them because I didn't have one and I didn't really see the need for one for myself, but hearing about kind of the, the versatility and all the kind of cool stuff. Do I think it's for me? Probably not. But you know what? It's a really cool machine for a lot of people. And for the right person, you can do a lot with it. Yeah. You can you can upscale your your manufacturing extremely quickly to be able to do a lot of different things. And so I think for the right person, for the right application, it's a great tool. Yeah. Um, but for somebody like me who's creating cosplay props and really just needs stupidly big printers. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like to be able to print in one material and just go, I don't think it's for me, but I think it's an amazing thing that's going to help further the printing community. Like we were yes. talking about already, uh, Bruce is already talking potentially about adding tool changer stuff to their next printer, the Max. Uh, which would be awesome. And that, that really means that we're pushing the printing community into its next steps. Yeah, I'm really excited about that because um, you know, Prusa printers are known for just working. And uh, this doesn't. Like, it takes some, some love and yeah. some desire you know, to build the kit from like 
cut the box open to running, it's probably a 20 hour build. It's a big, it's a big project. Yeah. Um, you know, building four tool heads kind of makes you feel like you're in a factory for like a day. You know, and wiring, it takes a long time. So, uh, although the wiring kit that E3D provides is pretty good. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's not for beginners. Uh, it's not for everybody, but it's not as hard as some people have made it out to be. And yeah. I, I think that I, I want to convey that is, um, you know, go about it the, go about it the way it's kind of meant to be gone about and you'll have better luck than trying to force your way through it the way you've always done. I think with with how some of the material is found, it can seem kind of intimidating um, to be like, there's not a whole lot out there. And I think what's great is E3D is doing a push for, hey, we want more material out there. Can you help us with this? Mm -hmm. So that way people can actually see what this is truly about. And that's kind of why we're doing this video as well is we have a lot of friends at E3D, we, we love them. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's cool that they're finally pushing for that. And hopefully with this, those people who were, maybe not me, but in between us of like, maybe on the edge, they'll be able to see that, no, this is not as intimidating as you think. Like it's still, it's, it's a big tool. It's a lot of cool stuff, but it's not as bad as you think. Like if you're doing it correctly, if you're, if you're seeing the material, you're asking the right questions, you're able to find those things that you need. Yeah. So when it's coming down to it, a lot of people are, are curious about where to find the material um, for doing that kind of stuff. Where do people find uh, the resources, the firmware, and stuff like that, the community to really help get behind building this? So there's a really good form on E3D's form specifically dedicated towards the tool changer. Um, there is the E3D Discord, which is like, there's a lot of stuff on there. It's, it's kind of intense. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I think E3D's website, uh, starting with the GitHub, starting with the guides, and then as we start to get Tool Changer XYZ online, uh, that will be a good resource. And our Discord is the right people are there to help you. Uh, and uh, it's been a, a good welcoming community for that stuff. Yeah. So. Which like, not to brag, but our community is pretty fucking dope. <laughs> it's been nice. We like we we have a lot of people in there who just love to create um, and love to help each other, um, and it's been awesome taking this thing that was we're gonna sit in the top of the maker space and just record for a night while everybody's working around us to now we have a community, we have mm -hmm. fans, we have people who want to help us on projects and want to be able to help make the maker community even bigger bigger than it already is. And like this this video is, is very apparent of this. We got the questions from the community and we're trying to give back as much as we can. Yeah. Like that's, that's the awesomeness of it. Um, thank you man for for teaching me taking the time to be able to show me about a lot of this to be able to show the community a lot about this do you have anything more that you want to do you want to show off about it yeah but uh, different videos um <laughs> fair enough fair enough you know i would love to dig into calibration i'd love to dig into slicing um you know but a lot of that stuff Renee has already done amazing work with. So make sure to check out Renee Drax's videos that he's done. Um, he's put an incredible amount of effort in production quality far and above anything we're ever going to do. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, you know, let us know what you want to see. If there's any questions you have on this or any anything else you want to see in the future, we're up for it. Fair enough. So well. With that, um, thank you for joining us for however long this video turns out to be. I'm guessing it's going to be a little long. Um, <laughs> and thank you for, for sitting down with us and being able to check out this cool video. Um, like Joe said, we, we hope to be able to do more of these in the future. We hope to be able to uh, do cool stuff like this and be able to show off other stuff. Um, and if you like it, tell us. Be vocal. Follow us on social. Tell us about what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it, what edits I did that were really weird that you didn't like. <laughs> um, we'll see. Uh, and hopefully, 
hopefully we are able to be encouraged to do more of this stuff and create more cool stuff. Yeah. So until next time, keep making stuff and stay awesome. This is the end of the video. <laughs> I was sitting there like, like, someone needs to say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you man. Did not <laughs> uh, what a